to get my picture because I'll be typing away and be muted, which be best so it doesn't drive you all crazy. Okay. So, all right. Well, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Paula. Hi, my name is Beth, and I work for the City of Wilsonville, and I'm here to show you how to watch the Planning Commission meeting live tonight on the city's YouTube channel. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So tonight, the Planning Commission meeting starts at 6 o'clock, and you're going to go to the city's website, and up here in the corner. Well done, Beth. Okay, I do see the live now video. And well done, Beth. Okay, I do see the live now video. And well done. Can I do see the live now video? Can I do see the live now video? Can I do see the live now video? I think you're in an echo feedback situation, Dan. You know, I'm trying to mute here. You're in an echo feedback situation, Dan. I'm trying to mute. You're in an echo feedback situation, Dan. I'm trying to mute. You're in an echo feedback situation, Dan. I'm trying to mute. You're in an echo feedback situation, Dan. I'm trying to mute. You're in an echo feedback situation, Dan. I'm trying to mute. You're in an echo feedback situation, Dan. Dan, do you just need to close that browser window? Okay, that should take care of it. Okay. That was fun. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to launch YouTube on another screen without sound. Uh, and I see Brianne, Jennifer, and Ron have joined us. So I'm going to go ahead and um, promote them to panelists. Welcome. Right, so we have and Jerry. So we have five. Hello. Hello, Jerry. Welcome. Am I the last one in? No. <clears throat> You're good. So we have everyone. Not sure why my picture is not showing. Oh, here we go. Uh, there you are. <clears throat> and for those that didn't hear, I am just pushing a few buttons in preparation uh, to just so I can see what everyone else is seeing on Zoom. or on YouTube. So give me just a moment. I'm gonna mute myself and go get some. Welcome, uh, Brianne. Is that is that how you uh, pronounce your name? Tuszynski? Yeah, it is. Brianne. Yeah, Brianne Tuszynski. Uh, we're happy to uh, have you join? I'm excited to be here. Oh yeah, welcome. Thank you. Wish we could greet you in person. Thanks. There may be a cat popping in here every once in a while, just as a warning. We love cats. Go away. <laughs> That's the worst thing that happens in this meeting. We'll be just fine. <laughs> Or we lose Jerry out into the uh, virtual forest back there. 
Ah, that's uh, what is that? Uh, that's Silver Falls. Okay, yeah, I thought so. Running right into my head. <laughs> <laughs> I could adjust that somehow. <clears throat> Well, at least you don't have fire behind you, Jerry. <laughs> well, I've really been sweating Silver Falls in this fire. Yeah, absolutely. It's getting close, that's for sure. It'll be very interesting to go back into those areas that, uh, that we frequent and see what they uh, look like now. Interesting is not the word I would use. Yeah. I am encouraged, however, by how the gorge has begun to rebound. There's Phyllis. Hello, Phyllis. You're muted. Hey, Phyllis, you're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> OK. That's um, hey, there it goes. Perfect. All right. Yep. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. And we already know that uh, Commissioner Woods isn't joining us, correct? So I think we are, we have two minutes, Chair Mesba, and then we look uh, live and ready to go. I have all your screens up on. YouTube on a big TV, so look good. Great, that's fantastic. That's reassuring, Dan. <laughs> I won't tell my teenager, else he'll punk me just you know to get it up on YouTube. <laughs> hey Jennifer, I don't know if it's just me. I'm you're uh, pretty quiet on your audio. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's go through and do an audio check for the commissioners. Uh, so Jennifer, we heard Ron, you're nice and loud. Brianne? Yep, testing. Okay, Jerry? Yes. Phyllis? Yes. Okay. So I'm, still pretty, all... I'm still pretty quiet. I can switch to my Stormtrooper headset. It's, I, know well, I can hear you fine. Uh, Ron, is, is Jennifer coming through not loud enough to you or uh, everybody is not coming loud enough to you? Um, is, is Jennifer coming through not loud enough to you or uh, everybody is not coming loud? No, it's just Jennifer. Everybody else is fine. Okay. Anybody else having trouble hearing me? Yeah, I can't hear you. Okay. I mean, faintly. There, that's always better. I assume, is it better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent, okay. I feel comfortable too, to be honest. It doesn't look like it, but it is. <laughs> Welcome to the city of Wilsonville Planning Commission meeting of September 16th. This is uh, a rescheduled meeting of September 9th which is our usual meeting time. Uh, roll call, please. You're muted. Paula. There we go. There yep. Yeah. Uh, Chair uh, Cameron Mesbaugh. Here. Vice Chair Ron Heberlein. Here. Jerry Greenfield. Here. Brianne Tusinski. Here. Jennifer Willard. Here. Aaron Woods. Phyllis Millen. Here. Thank you. Now we'll all rise uh, while uh, Polly leads us through the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag I, of the United, United States, States of America. America. And to the Republic for which it stands, 
one nation, one nation under God, God. Indivisible. indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Uh, this is the time that citizens have the opportunity to address the Planning Commission regarding any item that is not already scheduled for a public hearing tonight, and we don't have any item for public hearing tonight. Therefore, if any member of the audience uh, would like to uh, speak about any work session item or any other matter of concern, <clears throat> Please raise your hand uh, by sending a message uh, to the recorder via Zoom chat function so that we may hear from you now. Just wanted to confirm if Mr. Spence wanted to talk at this time. Thank you. Oops. Sorry, say that again, Dick. Did you want to speak at this time? No, I do not. Okay, thank you. Did you hear me? Yes, thank yeah. you. Maybe later. <clears throat> and that was that was the only comment we had, uh, Mr. Pauli? Yes. Very good. Uh, so the uh, next item is an administrative matter introducing uh, our new uh, member of the Planning Commission, Brianne Tuzinski. Uh, it says, brief introduction. I don't know if you're supposed to introduce yourself, Brianne, or uh, others have an introduction or uh, resume for you. Uh, I, I can go ahead and start if you'd like, Chair. Uh, so Miranda and I had the privilege of sitting down with Brianne and getting to know her a, a bit more, which was a delight. And you know, th some things that really stuck out to me as I was able to get acquainted with her a bit is the length that she spent most of her life here in the Wilsonville area uh, and is, is really happy to be here um, as an adult and with her family and um, I, I also know that she's going to ask a, a lot of good questions. She's a real estate appraiser by trade, and us planners know they ask a lot of good questions. And so, um, and also very impressed uh, with her passion for public service and interest in, in filling this role. So uh, we're excited to have her. I think she'll be a great addition uh, to the Planning Commission. So Brianne, with that, would you like to add anything else in the way of introduction and then as is tradition, if the commission is willing to go and offer a bit of introduction of yourselves as well. Uh, sure. I, uh, like you said, I'm a uh, real estate appraiser by trade. Uh, I studied political science when I was in college, so I have a little bit of political background. Um, know a lot about housing. Uh, this, uh, some of the other stuff is I'm going to kind of hit the ground running on with the uh, i5 bridge and that kind of stuff but i'm excited to learn and i really am very excited to be here so uh thanks and i can't wait to get all to know all of you excellent now we are supposed to introduce ourselves uh, commissioner willard do you want to start absolutely hello i'm jennifer willard i'm one of the newer members of the planning commission as well i've been in wilsonville for about six seven years now and um, I am an engineering manager out at Intel and I'm on the construction side of Intel. I've been there for, for 20 years this month. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Comm Commissioner Millen. Hi, uh, I've been in Wilsonville almost 30 years. So I've got some longevity here and uh, served on DRB as many of the other commissioners have and worked on one of the very early uh, parks and rec um, plans. Um, other than that, I live on the uh, west side of, of um, Wilsonville, so that's a little, that's a different perspective than the folks who live on the east side, so nice to meet you, Brianna. Nice Welcome. to meet you. We might be neighbors. I'm on the west side, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Commissioner Haberlein? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Mespa. Yeah, Ron Haberlein. Um, 
I have lived in Wilsonville for eight years. Um, I both live and work in Wilsonville. Uh, I work at Collins Aerospace. Um, so uh, just down the road from my house, um, I'm over on the east side of town. Um, over by the Street of Dreams. Um, and uh, I was on a development review board before I moved to planning commission. And I've been on planning commission for, uh, I think it's a year and a half now. Um, and so have, uh, have enjoyed uh, the variety of things that we've been doing here and, uh, and look forward to continuing that work and, and working with you, Brian. Great, thanks, nice to meet you. <laughs> Commissioner Greenfield. Yeah, I've lived in Wilsonville for 12 years now, having retired here from uh, Japan where I taught for 12 years. I'm a retired college professor where my fields were uh, originally photography, but later branched out to uh, uh, aesthetics and uh, art history and um, well, lots of stuff anyway. Um, uh, I, I was on DRB for a couple of terms before joining Planning Commission, I don't know how many years ago. I'm in my second term, uh, and I was for a time uh, chair. I stepped back this year. Great. And I have lived in Wilsonville for exactly five years. Um, I moved here from the Madison, Wisconsin area uh, after I retired from uh, urban and regional planning, uh, civil and environmental engineering, and uh, municipal engineering work that I did there. Um, and this is my fourth year on the planning commission, uh, start of the second term. Great. Um, and this is a lot of fun. I can. <laughs> it is. So the next administrative item is a consideration of the July 8th, 2020 Planning Commission minutes. Are there any corrections, additions? Seeing none, I think it's approved as submitted. Um, we are in the throes of our work session now. The I-5 pedestrian bridge project. Uh, Mr. Pauly, uh, do you want to uh, introduce the staff uh, that are going to be making presentations? Certainly, thank you, Chair Mesba. Uh, we're excited. Uh, this has been a really interesting project uh, for I think the commission and the whole community to be involved in. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of work done, a lot of outreach, a lot of additional design, and you know the team's excited to share it tonight. And so we have Zach Weigel here, uh, who's the project manager for the city, as well as uh, the support of consultants. So with that, I'll turn it over to Zach to introduce more of the project, as well as the consultants that will be helping tonight. Hey Dan, uh, is, is uh, Alex able to share his screen or, or is Casey sharing her screen for the- Casey will be sharing her screen. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Mesbaugh and members of Planning Commission. As Dave, my name is Zach Weigel, Capital Projects <laughs> Engineering Manager. And uh, we're here before you tonight uh, with me as, um, as Dan said, is uh, Alex Dupey and Casey Howard with MIG. Um, I think last time we were here uh, before you, uh, we had been uh, checking in, getting your feedback on the last minute uh, design concepts for the bridge and for the plaza um, right before we went out to the public to get their feedback. So um, that public engagement for the I-5 pedestrian bridge, the plaza, gateway plaza is completed and Alex and Katie and Casey are gonna walk through a summary of that um, of that analysis uh, of the feedback that we received um, with you tonight. Um, I just wanted to, to uh, say that uh, some of the things that we'd like you to think about and some of the feedback that we need from you uh, tonight that we will share with the uh, 
uh, city council when they consider um, when they provide feedback for the project uh, on Monday at their meeting. Um, some of the things are uh, which bridge design best reflects the, the project's goals and priorities and the themes that were established early on in the project. And, and um, some of the guiding design principles that we established early on. And then also thinking back to uh, the town center plan and the work that came out of that, that project and making sure the bridge uh, design uh, recommendation that you make uh, fits with those needs. And then also uh, Alex will touch on this a little bit later, but verifying that the bridge design elements that the public uh, prioritize are, are the one, ones that you agree with and uh, letting us know if there are any other bridge elements that you'd like to see um, prioritized as well. And then with the plaza, um, you'll see kind of in the outreach uh, feedback uh, the design team is recommending moving forward with a combination of the drops and ripples and the river oxbow uh, plaza and just confirming that that direction uh, moving forward and then and then if there's a number of plaza elements that were prioritized by the community and making sure that those are you agree with those and um, and if there are any additional plaza elements to to consider so with that, I'll turn it over to Alex Stoopy and uh, you can go through the summary. Thank you. Great, thank you, Zach. Um, I just wanted to mention to you, Bob Goodrich is also with us tonight. He's the consultant project manager with Dell Consulting. So if there are specific questions about the bridge as I step through that, any um, more technical questions, um, I'll, I'll defer to him to, to answer those questions. Uh, so. Casey, I'm gonna step through the kind of the initial public involvement kind of process and talk about the bridge elements and structures and the results of that the engagement that we've done in July and August. Casey is gonna talk about the plaza concepts and some of those specific elements. As Zach mentioned, um, we are in the process of moving from a number of concepts and alternatives to a recommended path forward for both the bridge and the plaza. So it's important for us tonight to um, gather your input so that we can start to um, you know, consolidate a lot of these concepts into um, an alternative for the plaza and the concept that we can move forward into more um, uh, detailed design. So with that, uh, Casey, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so many of you have been part of the, the engagement process that happened over the last couple months. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about um, kind of what the results were. We hosted um, three public open houses on the same day at 12, 4, and 6 o'clock to accommodate uh, varying schedules. We also had a survey that gave us a lot of information uh, in the direction or the of the direction for what the community was thinking about in terms of kind of what's important and what meets the, the themes and goals that were established early in this process. Um, the exciting thing before we get into it is that many of these um, the kind of level of input is really aligned with what we've heard earlier in the process as well, too. So it's nice to see that we're you know, on the right trajectory or the right path uh, moving as we get into more kind of refined concepts. Um, as Zach said, there are four key questions that we're going to need answers tonight, um, specifically about the bridge themes, but also about you know, lighting, other safety measures, and then the plaza direction as well, too. Um, next slide. Just a quick summary of what we, um, the number of people that were involved. We had about 300 uh, survey participants, which was great. Uh, we had about 50 virtual open house participants. Um, again, we hosted those at three separate times on the same day uh, to capture different people, different times, knowing that we are um, you know, in unique times for public engagement. And what we found is that many people, actually the most people, um, tuned in at the lunch hour at our 12 o'clock session, which is you know, much different than you would expect for an in-person event where people want to come at night when they're off work. So something to think about as we move forward um, and other public engagement, but if you're already in front of a computer, people came through and uh, provided great input. Uh, most people live in, live in Wilsonville, some work here. Um, and you know, not surprisingly, and this is pretty consistent with a lot of types of surveys, um, primarily um, homeowners have responded by about three quarters of the respondents were homeowners, but we also got a fair bit of renters as well too. About a quarter of people who responded were renters. And that's great to see that um, 
even though it is primarily ownership, we're getting a large number of renters there as well too. And that's about overall about two and a half times the increase in survey participation from what we did in February. So the outreach is better. People are certainly hearing about it. And obviously the interest is there as well too. Uh, next slide. So I'm not gonna step through each of these questions. Um, these are, this is the list of questions that we asked at, uh, in the survey itself. If you see a bar chart, um, that little box up at the top uh, next to a question, those are questions that we asked in both the survey and the open house. And so when we were able to be able to ask a similar question in that format, we did it in both, the, both um, locations. So it's just an identifier. If you see that coming through what that means, um, if it doesn't have that, that means that that was just a survey question. And so we encourage people to be in both. If you took, went to the open house, we encourage people to take the survey. Um, one wasn't exclusive of the other. Next slide. Uh, we also um, asked a number of open-ended responses with the survey. And you know, many of these themes that came out of this survey are pretty consistent with what we've heard in the past. Um, overall, um, strong support for the project, um, but there are, are you know, concerns about cost or you know, why this project should happen anyways. And those aren't new concerns. We've heard those you know, over time, not just with this, but for years, even through Town Center. Uh, Health, safety, and access. A lot of people had questions or you know, different needs or desires for how the bridge were constructed to provide um, access to various modes. Some people asked about art and kind of how we should you know, allocate or accommodate art within the, the specific areas. And then there were a few questions on the ramp, the west ramp primarily. Um, and that's again, not surprising because we haven't focused on that as much because there are, to be honest, fewer options about that. Um, so people were just curious about kind of how that west ramp comes down and eventually connects to the, the Wilsonville Transit Center. But overall support for the project, um, just with kind of specific questions um, for the team. Next slide. Um, if you've seen meetings that we've done before, we do um, lots of wall graphicking. Uh, we've transitioned to be able to do this virtually now. And so during each of the, the meetings, we kept a comprehensive wall graphic for all three meetings. And so this uh, graphic, which I'm not gonna go into detail on, captures the discussion in addition to the polling that we did. So John Phoenix in our office um, developed this over the three meetings to capture kind of the essence of the discussion, things that you know people felt were important or they had concerns about. And this input in addition to the survey and the polling was used to um, develop the recommendations we're gonna step through tonight. All right, so let's talk about the alternatives. So um, as you remember, we had three um, distinct alternatives. And we asked people both within the survey and the polling to rank um, or kind of identify which they would think would be most iconic or defining within Wilsonville. And just for the color codes on the bottom, yellow and orange are more supportive, blue and blue and greenish are less supportive. And what we found is that um, the tight arch overall had the, the most support in terms of kind of making this an iconic or defining structure. Um, but when you look at the modern artistic, it actually had the highest number of definitely's in there that this would be iconic, but it also had the highest number of not at alls. So when you look at tight arch is definitely, most people said somewhat or definitely, the modern artistic had the most definitely, but also had the most not at all, which means that it's kind of a, a love or hate uh, relationship with that, with that bridge. The cable stay also fared well. Um, most people thought that you know it would you know could be an iconic structure, but we're seeing that the cable stay is really becoming the third option uh, for many of the questions that we're we're seeing. And this is kind of that first piece of whether or not it's an iconic. People would view it as an iconic structure. Next slide. Um, the next question we asked. You know there were a number of themes that we worked with you earlier on in the community in this process about family friendly, kind of evoking the Willamette River, um, harmony with nature. And again, the tight arch and the modern artistic come up at, at the top um, for you know, definitely, or at least somewhat um, showing support. Modern artistic, you know, it, again, it's, it evokes the strongest kind of reaction uh, to people. There were many people who felt that that was a very strong, it really supported those themes. But again, it also had a large number of people who thought that it didn't at all. So it's an interesting combination. But overall, the tight arch um, it showed the strongest support for somewhat indefinitely, followed by modern and then cable stay. Next slide. This was a question that we asked both 
in the open house and on the online survey, um, if you could rank in order of preference. Uh, the first choice for both the open house and the online survey is the Tide Arch, um, followed you know, somewhat closely by the modern artistic. Cable Stay was third in both, in both um, venues. I think that when we look in more detail though, you, know, you really get to, for like the mo modern artistic, it's the first choice for many or it's the last choice for many. You know, again, it kind of gets to that, that um, black and white question. Whereas you know, the, the Tide Arch, uh, many people felt that that was the strongest bridge type. Next slide. And then here's just a quick summary of results. When we look at that first question of iconic or defining structure, Tide Arch and modern artistic definitely come to the top. Um, cable stay is slightly below that. When we think about the themes that evoke Wilsonville, tight arch again uh, comes to the top with, with the strongest in terms of kind of definitely or somewhat modern artistic again is at the top there with very strong preferences either way. And then the cable stay again is the third for those themes. When we looked at the overall rankings by preference, um, the tight arch and modern artistic are fairly close uh, in terms of of ranking, the tight arch still is the top ranked, followed by the modern artistic, and then the cable stay is still, you know, ranked up there as well too, but just not quite as strongly as what the other two um, bridge uh, options uh, showed. And of course, you know, everybody picks the most expensive. <laughs> um, the, you know, the cost estimates, you know, which are still very general. Um, the tight arch is likely still the most expensive project, um, primarily about you know, how it's constructed or different types of, you know, different types of bridge elements. Um, the modern artistic and cable stay are more similar in terms of bridge costs. I think the question with the modern artistic is that because there are more variables within that bridge, um, you know, the cost is something that we would need to define more in depth as those specific elements come into play. Um, it's something that, you know, you really need to do well to pull off. And I think that's something that, you know, why you're seeing kind of a, a, a larger range in there in terms of what that modern artistic <laughs> might be and what it might evoke. Next slide. And then finally, before we get to questions, we also asked about, you know, are there specific types of customizations that might, um, you know, kind of come to the top when people think about what the bridge might look like in terms of that iconic structure. Um, illuminating, illuminating the bridge structure uh, was by far the strongest in terms of vote getters. Um, and that's followed closely with the, the adjustable LED lighting along the cables or railing. So when we think about those two together, lighting is very important for people um, who took the survey and were part of the polling. Um, but also, you know, some other unique elements like custom safety fencing that is both a user as well as viewer experience, depending on what that looks like and how that is. Um, that's also high up there. Um, and then to some degree, shape of the bridge supports. And so we've seen that in other types of bridges where do you have stamped concrete or specific elements within that structure itself to kind of make it unique uh, more at the ground scale. So those are the top four or five um, that come together, but I wanted to stop here and just have a brief discussion about your thoughts on the input or on the community input and if there's direction you can give us moving forward. I found it really interesting how polarizing the uh, the modern artistic is. You either love it or you hate it. That's interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think it's it's dependent on yeah, kind of what that end product is, you know, it's, it's a little yeah. bit more organic um, and undefined. And I think some of the concepts that we saw last time were a little more whimsical too. Mm -hmm. And I think that has, that's probably uh, a, a fairly polarizing element is how, how much whimsy is put into them. That's true. Thank you. Uh, Alex, yes. Jerry Greenfield here. I attended all three uh, of the uh, open house sessions and uh, w without voting, I, I didn't want to paint the uh, results by, by voting, but I, I attended them through. Uh, I'm struck by the considerable differences in the responses of the, uh, the, in the, uh, the input of the three groups, uh, which came to very different conclusions overall about the, the bridge design, as well as the, uh, the landing. 
Uh, have you speculated about that? Why, what the reasons for those differences are? Well, so in terms of for both the open house and the survey, the top choice if we looked at ranking is the tight arch design. Um, there was, you know, I think more, you know, as uh, Commissioner Willard spoke, there there is more of a kind of a love or hate relationship with the, with the modern artistic, and I think that's that's something that you know it's a different type of bridge than people are used to seeing. Um, so I think overall there was general alignment between the two. Um, I think the differences that we see with um, some of the other bridge types really came out of the survey because we were out able to ask questions about theme and identity. And that's, that's something where we had a lot more variation in terms of the, the results. Alex, I have a, this is Phyllis. Um, I've just got a couple of uh, question comments. Um, when, it, when the people were talking about the uh, lighting, uh, they were, you know, very favorable about different lighting options. Were they thinking in terms of like the, like the new Tillicum Bridge and stuff that changes colors? Is, do you think that's what, what kind of inspired people to think about that or, or motivated them to rank that higher? Well, I think there's, you know, we, we did talk about that a bit. And I think there's a, a, a thought from both the community or from the, the open house and certainly was that this should be an iconic structure 24 hours a day. And so, you know, having that as, you know, whether or not you're viewing it at 12 o'clock in the afternoon or nine o'clock at night, um, there should be, you know, kind of ability to really kind of identify that bridge as a unique structural element um, that's, that's Wilsonville. And so whether or not that's lighting like on the telecom or it's more, you know, just kind of focused white light, I think that's still to be determined, but it, there, it was a high, um, percentage of people that thought that that was a very important element to carry forward within the next round of comments. And uh, additionally, was there any, um, and I know this is a little early on, but but was there any linking of whether or not they like the drops and ripples versus the gateway loop with the bridge style? Was there any uh, connections being made there or is, was that just not even broached? Um, that's not a question we ask directly. Um, you know, I think it is something, and, and Casey will will talk about the, con the plaza concepts here in just a moment. I think that is something we would think about it for the recommended alternative for the plaza and how it relates to the, the recommended bridge structure. Um, you know, we didn't ask um, specifically how would you place one with the other. Uh, okay. But I think what we could say is if this is the recommended bridge type, we can address that. Um, those specific aesthetic elements through the plaza as well, too. Okay. And there's just one other comment, and it's really not with the design, but it is I, I, somewhere in here. I, I caught the, the mention about, oh, I know it was in your, your kind of your storyboard here um, about Boone's Ferry and the, and the um, connecting that. So I think that's with that, the, you know, how are people going to get onto the bridge on the west side? I mean, the east side seems easy, but the west side and making it more accessible so people don't have to go through that intersection, that rather nasty intersection of Wilsonville Road and Boone's Ferry and stuff. So I think that that's a lot of concern to a lot of folks. So I just, you know, I see that's coming out even in in, in the surveys and the um, online. So I think, I think you're right. There's definitely questions about that. And that's... Um... One reason why we weren't focusing on as much is because there's many fewer options over there um, because, you know, there's limited space. Right. But I think making sure, as you say, you know, have that, that strong connection um, to those other amenities is going to be really important and something we'll consider through the recommended alternative. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Heberlein? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, Alex, from, from my perspective, I don't, I don't have any fundamental issue in terms of, of the two questions you have here. Um, I, you know, the, my preferences align with, um, with the bridge results, um, and the, the custom lighting and, and safety fencing were two of the things that, that I keyed into as well as, as things that I thought were important in terms of what was presented as available options. Um, the one thing that, that I would like to know and like to have feedback from the community is, in, in, in the online survey and in, in the open house, um, which I, I went and looked at and, and participated in both of those so that I could understand what those questions were. 
I would be very curious to understand how people's opinions would change if they had the estimated costs for the bridge uh, alternatives in hand when they were making their decisions and whether or not that's something that would be value added to to go back out and ask that question because you know it while i i i really clutch in with the tide arch and that's the one that that really responded in in me seeing the cost and a 30 percent cost uh, higher you know estimated cost than the other two definitely gives me pause in terms of okay well is is that you know, how I would want to spend my own money just because I like that one, you know, aesthetically better. So uh, that, I guess that's my main comment about this uh, is, is, is whether or not the cost, the cost estimates would have a big impact on uh, what the, the residents uh, would select for their preference um, with that in mind as well. Yeah, and I, I think that gets to the question, which is why we need direction from planning commission on how to how to, how to start moving, thinking about moving forward is, you know, if we get to that, that first question of themes and priorities, you know, are there bridge types, you know, if cost is a consideration, are there bridge types that, that do meet those original goals and objectives set out by the project, you know, early on in the process? And, and yet cost is certainly an issue. I think, you know, that's something that, that um, there are differences between the bridge types and, you know, kind of the direction um, that we're starting to look for is, <clears throat> where, to, where to focus energies within the project. Sure. Um, I, apart from the construction costs, are there, um, is there any consideration of up uh, of maintenance costs, say over the life of uh, 10, 20 years, um, how will these bridges weather? Um, I think that's a question probably for Zach or Bob uh, to answer. Yeah, this is Bob. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> um, maintenance cost differences um, are not going to be significantly different between the three, um, you know, in terms of the material durability. What I think what you will see for differences is the cable stay and tide arches are just, they're taller, higher above the deck. And so the, the ongoing inspection cycles that need to be done on bridges um, will be a little bit more involved just for accessing the different bridge elements that are higher in the air. Um, the other consideration I think for the modern artistic is because much of the bridge depends on some of the, the aesthetic features attached to the bridge, how those weather over time um, is a bigger variable. And I think something that you know, should be considered, um, you know, in just through this process is the, you know, the bright, the bright blue that's shown in some of the visualizations may not be bright blue in five or 10 or, you know, 15 years, just the, the, the fading of the color, so to speak, or the, um, so th those are some of the differences I think to consider long-term. Thank you. I was thinking about that with the modern artistic about how the the it's a little bit more cosmetic, um, but you could also give it a facelift more easily or modernize it um, if, if, if a couple of years down the road. Is that is that a true statement or no? Yeah, I'd say I'd say that's a true statement, and that would maybe speak to a you know long term maintenance might not be the right word, but you know a longer term cost associated with that option that the other two may not have. Like remodeling. Or would have less of. Remodeling, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Renovation. Commissioner Haverline, were you done? Uh... Yeah, I, I think, you know, from, from my perspective, I could see any of the three meeting the general themes and priorities. Um, it, it, to me, comes down to, you know, what, what is the public really looking for in terms of the design? None of them said no, they, they absolutely wouldn't you know, represent Wilsonville well. Commissioner Jasinski, I don't know if you had seen any of these before this meeting, or is this the first time you're seeing it? And yeah, I, uh, I got a copy of the, uh, of the um, kind of overlook of everything that's going on. Um, my, my only concern, I guess, going forward is with the modern bridge design. Uh, I mean, I haven't really seen a lot of mock-ups of it or anything like that. Uh, how modern is it going to look in 25 years? You know, a lot of people take risks with, 
you know, these big, fancy, trendy look, uh, design things. And, and is that going to still look good in, you know, 20, 50, 25, 50 years, that kind of thing? Or is it easy going to be easier to change that design if it doesn't meet tastes down the line? Yeah, the tight arch seems to me to be a pretty timeless um, kind of an aesthetic and design. And um, it seems to give the impression of uh, quality uh, in its construction, strength, whatever the proper word is for it. Uh, but on the other hand, the modern artistic, as we just heard, uh, is more amenable to uh, updating and changing and, and um, the aesthetic is more flexible as a result. I don't know that you can do much other than perhaps color change with the arches. Um, so uh, any other comments? I don't know if these were helpful at all, Alex, uh, as comments or? Just maybe if I could summarize to make sure that we're, we're kind of hearing. So in terms of kind of the kind of customized features, I heard, you know, Custom lighting and and safety fencing are something that um, would be of interest to move forward. Like for to for to spe be specific in some of the, the customization features. I mean, there's going to be requirements on the bridge regardless of some of these, but the time we spend to design them on um, those two, I've heard are, are things to keep pushing forward. I think the question, um, Commissioner Mesbaugh, is if if there is a bridge type that is that planning commission would lean towards, that would be helpful in helping us understand, you know, the direction. And certainly we'll get direction from city council next week, but just to, you know, kind of understand if there's a preference um, moving forward here on a certain bridge type. That's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> we look at what the community said. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a little more, a little more clear, but if there are, you know, opinions from the commission about which bridge that would be that would be helpful, I think. Well, what I was hearing is the uh, tide arch definitely uh, gets the aesthetics uh, uh, marks, but everybody kind of worries about the added cost of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, I throw that out there just for further uh, discussion by the commissioners. Well, when I'm considering a major expense personally, I think about its uh, long-term sort of amortization. In the case of a bridge like this, it's there for a long term and the, the additional cost spread out over that term is not all that great. And if I remember correctly, the additional cost is mostly uh, due to the complexity of, of constructing it because traffic needs to be dealt with and all kinds of stuff like that. Am I remembering that correctly, Alex? Uh, I believe so, Bob. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. The tide arch just has a generally more complex construction sequence. So I, I didn't I... actually give my opinion of my, my considered preference is the tide arch. Ron Heberlein, you said the same thing, but uh, you were kind of hedging it because of the cost. Yeah, it, it is still my my preference from a design standpoint, um, but uh, I could be swayed into the others if if there is as significant of a cost difference as there is. I mean, we're talking you know a 30, 30 to forty percent difference in potential cost. That's that's a lot. Um, and even I, I acknowledge uh, Chair, uh, Commissioner Greenfield's uh, comments on amortization, and, and that's true. Um, but you know, it, it it's a big difference. So yes, it's still my pri my uh, my number one choice. But uh, I wouldn't be uh, disappointed with another one if it made more fiscal sense to go that way. Okay. Any, any other uh, commissioner wants to? Yeah, for, for me, 
it, it, I find it, I find it, uh, I'm struggling a little bit with the identified themes, you know, the, which one could be done more in harmony with nature, more family friendly, more um, emphasizing our, our proximity to the river, inclusive and welcoming. The mod modern artistic has much more uh, levers to pull to, to pull out those emotions and connect with those themes. The tight arch doesn't do that to me. It doesn't connect with those themes. I personally like the tight arch better, but I don't think it connects with those themes. So I think we need to decide how important those themes are to the bridge design. Very good. Commissioner Mellon. Yeah, I, I have always liked the tight arch and I, I'm not totally swayed just because of the extra cost. I agree when you, <clears throat> it's sort of like when you're building a house or something and you go, oh, is it worth that extra, you know, amount to get what I really want? And if you don't do it, you often regret it. Um, I think we've all, you know, done a remodel and said, oh, why didn't we go for that upgrade on that? We would have preferred it. Um, I, th that was an interesting comment about how much the modern artistic may be able to bring out some of the themes, but I'm wondering if people aren't looking at the theme of connectedness, et cetera, the nature, and having that more uh, play out in the um, landing area. I think that might be a better place to have some of that. This is you know, this tight arch is, is something you're just going to kind of see are, um, you know, that's going to be very visible. Um, so I'm, I'm still leaning towards the tight arch. Let me leave it there. Thank you. Commissioner Tuszynski. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, I'm leaning towards the tight arch as well. My thought is maybe even if it doesn't necessarily represent the river and nature and that kind of thing, there's other design themes we can bring in via the lighting or the custom fencing to kind of still give it that flavor of being near the river and that kind of thing. But I, I think overall the tight arch is where I'm gonna, where I'm gonna lean. So um, to me, <laughs> being of iconic on a bridge uh, is that you're driving under it at 60, 65 miles an hour and you just see it in a split second. And we had a conversation way back when we were meeting in face to face about how much lingering on this bridge is going to be happening. And I wasn't convinced because of the, uh, the pollution that the interstate uh, generates right above it, that people are going to want to sit around and, and kind of ponder the symbolism of the fence or whatever. So, uh, I think the place for those kinds of um, experiential, aesthetic and educational uh, kind of uh, motifs uh, are in the plazas. And, and we have plenty of opportunity there for uh, having um, displays and all kinds of stuff that will do that. Uh, to me, uh, the shape of the tide arch is a kind of classic um, and stunning uh, aesthetic that, that is imprinted as you just go by it very quickly. You don't have to slow down and, and kind of look at the details. Uh, so um, I, my preference is, is there as well. Um, I also share... Commissioner Heberlein's concerns that this be something that Wilsonville wants to invest in uh, as an iconic kind of project for the city and that it doesn't become uh, an example of people sitting around and, and uh, going for an expensive project just because somebody else in their is going to, to share in the cost. Uh, we all will share in the cost, but uh, the 40, 30, 40% difference that uh, Commissioner Heberlein refers to uh, can potentially become an issue, especially since uh, local units of government are starting to have issues with 
with revenues and those kinds of things. Now, I said that, and I'm not sure if where the money for the bridge will be coming from and whether those revenues are being impacted right now or, or whether they've already been um, firmly established. So all of those are unknowns to me. Uh, and maybe there's information right now that can be shared. But I, I, I have a preference for the tide arch, given all those qualifications. And I think as we get into more detail, or Zach, did you want to yeah, I think um, I can answer a few of those questions. I, the design team did talk about, you know, possible questions about cost, and uh, the concern was that the the uh, the um, the public outreach, the questions were getting quite long, and you know, two million dollars over you know, a, a, on a project that's going to outlive all of us. Uh, we would just wanted to make sure we got what the public um, really wanted to see in this location, what they felt was really Wilsonville without the influence of the cost. Um, if you go back to that, that slide, I just want to, to point out that um, that's not the cost estimate for the bridge. Those are cost ranges Everything else being equal, that's the difference that you would see between the two bridges. So that's not the total cost estimate. So when you're talking about 30, 40% difference, that's not that accurate, but, um, but it is higher. Um, so, in, so as far as funding, what we're looking at is a combination of, uh, of upcoming grant opportunities and uh, transportation system development charges. So. so Zach, explain the cost figures that are on this slide again. What do they represent? Yeah, maybe Bob can help me out here. But um, so what we did was we, we just took, we don't have a lot of design right now. So we took uh, general uh, cost estimates for the, the span, the bridge structure itself. And then tried to estimate what the cost differences would be based on the bridge type for the other things. So this really represents the the cost different the cost difference between each bridge type, given everything else that would add up to that would be the same for each bridge. So it allows you to compare the cost difference between the different bridge types. Uh, but it's not the complete look at the cost of the project. That helps. So let me let me say what I heard, and you <laughs> right. <clears throat> if you have just a simple, you know, no nothing bridge there, uh, that's the base cost. Then if you go with cables, eight point eight million dollars to that base cost. If you go with the modern artistic, then you you add six point nine to eight six million dollars to that basic cost. Is that is that what you're saying? Uh, maybe Bob can help. Sure, sure. I, um, no, so the costs shown here represent the the the, cons, the anticipated construction costs for the you know the main spans, the two main spans that we're looking at in the pictures plus the additional approach spans and approach retaining walls that lead up to these two main spans. And there's, there's some differences in there because the, the modern artistic has additional bridge structure because it's deeper, so it has to be higher in the air to provide the freeway clearance. So those cost differences are captured in this, in this total. So if you were to just go forward and build the tide arch, it would be eight and, eight and a half to 10.4 million is our cost range for the construction of the elements to get from the ground on one side up into the air over the roads and back down to the ground. So the um, and then the, the, the note here uh, explains that it doesn't include, you know, there's a lot of other pieces of the project that go into this that like Zach said, we're not far enough in design to have, you know, to have an understanding of what these are going to cost. Um, does that does that help? It does help. So these are actual bridge costs, but yes, 
the bridge costs. Uh, for comparison purposes, do we have any idea what percentage of the total cost this would be? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's a good question. Hundred percent to it, or, or you know, because th that goes to what uh, Commissioner Heberlein was saying. If yes. total cost is really about twice what you're seeing here, then the two million dollar difference is is really ten percent. Mm -hmm. I think it's unlikely to be double. Like I think the total project cost is probably between somewhere between fifty percent and hundred percent more from what you're seeing. So maybe if we look at the tide arch, it's pro the full cost is. I mean, on the outside, probably twenty million dollars. I don't. I don't think the project costs that much. It might be in the twelve to sixteen million dollar range. Um, when you add in the other the other elements, but of course, some of it depends on the plaza is the other big piece of the project cost here. That there's a lot of decisions to be made there that I think Casey and Alex will get into. You know that will affect what is that total project cost. So I think there's a similar discussion, um, but I'd I'd say it's it's more than fifty percent of the cost of the whole project. And we do have just a few minutes left. I want to make sure we we can hit. The plaza elements is plaza elements as well. Um, Commissioner Masvidal, is it is it okay to move forward knowing that we still have we still have work to do on some of these these specific pieces? We have all night. Where's the rush? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, never mind. <laughs> um, with, with that, then, are there any other questions on the, the cost estimates then? Um, then other. If, well, I was gonna. The only thing that I was gonna add, Alex, is uh, does it help to have uh, first choice, second choice by the commission, uh, based on the total cost or something, or is it just gonna muddy the water for you? Um, I'll, I'll defer to Zach and Bob on on that. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, this is information that we're gonna share with the city council at the meeting, so. It's really what you want to share with them. Uh, we could tell them you prefer the tight arch, but are concerned with the cost. You like the modern artistic, but um, because it can be, you know, it, it's easy to modernize later down the road and change. Um, we can share, you, you can do one, or rank one and two. Uh, I think uh, Commissioner. Uh, Haberline said that he thought all three would work. Uh, we could share that information as well. So, well, uh, that's that's fine. Uh, I think what uh, uh, I was hearing is that the, the preference is tight arch because of its strong kind of uh, iconic and aesthetic uh, message that it sends. Uh, it is more expensive, and uh, some of the commissioners said we just want to make sure that the community is willing to spend that much more to get that kind of an iconic structure. If not, then these other uh, options could also work, given that they have some uh, flexibility and strength as well. But we would our first choice would be the tight arch. So. I agree with that. I agree. Agreed. Okay. Plaza. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Casey. She's going to step through the, the ramp and plaza design alternatives. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Yep. Okay. So in a similar format, um, we asked questions about the three plaza options. And so this first one is asking participants based on the themes, which of these evoke Wilsonville. And we saw a consistency between the online survey and the virtual open house again, where the river oxbow option and the drops and ripples were pretty much neck and neck in first place for each of these. And the gateway loop um, had fallen behind as the third option. And then again, ranking the plaza concepts in order of preference. Um, we have a pretty split choice here on the drops and ripples and the river oxbow with the gateway loop lagging behind a bit um, with perhaps the, the drops and ripples coming in just slightly ahead. 
And then in this question here, we ask participants um, what type of bridge approach they would prefer. And so we gave them some different options that had these physical forms or qualities. And not surprisingly, it was actually um, just whichever ramp provides the most sound and visual buffering from I-5. So people are really concerned about that presence of the highway and trying to have some kind of visual and sound barrier um, to make the plaza more inviting and more approachable. And they cared less about the actual form, although the spiral loop lamp, loop, <laughs> loop ramp did come and last on this one. Um, and then we broke it down by specific features in a sort of visual preference survey. And so these were each ranked um, and these are again added between the online survey and the um, polling that we did in the virtual open house. And so we see a theme coming out here where planting for biodiversity or habitat um, came out on top climate adapted planting, which is kind of a low water, um, climate resilient plant palette came in second and then enhanced stormwater planters was in third. For shade and rain shelter, people were most interested in using a tree canopy or perhaps a modern artistic shelter and less um, drawn to your more standard picnic shelter type. For trees and planting, um, people reflected the, the character of Wilson Villa and the town center through some of these more formal forms. And so there's the tree LA that we uh, were showing in some of the options going along the ramp. And then these more formal planting arrangements and green walls as well that would go along the, the ramp itself. For gathering, um, not surprisingly, people are more interested in having multiple smaller spaces. Um, perhaps that's a reflection of our <laughs> current circumstances, um, but it is really helpful to know that people are shying away from having a really large hardscape area and want these more intimate experiences where they can have small groups or feel comfortable as an individual sitting in this space. Um, and then there's also a, a lean towards having more transitional spaces. So it's kind of a, an open uh, promenade style there. For art, people are most attracted to art that is interactive and functional um, or having multiple smaller installations scattered throughout and even murals and mosaics. And then this is a quick results comparison. We don't have a cost estimate on these because with the plazas it's it's more of a kit apart approach where we would mix and match different features and combine them into a final design and so we're just looking again that the drops and ripples and river oxbow were very close for first place um, and the gateway loop is quite a bit behind those two and this is just a summary slide of those top choices again I think there's kind of a resounding theme here of people being drawn to things that have high aesthetic quality, but are also functional. And it's also a reflection of the Wilsonville community and their values where they are drawn to uh, kind of this environmental value and highlighting the relationship with nature um, and having uh, more function out of these artistic pieces that we've brought up. And so that is it for our plaza pieces. Um, so the questions that we would like your feedback on are if you agree that the plaza design approach we should go with would combine the elements of the drops and ripples and the river oxbow concepts. And um, we would also like to know if there are any other plaza elements to consider in addition to the ones that were prior prioritized in the survey and open house, if there's anything else that you have in mind that we should be considering. Thank you. Commissioner Willard, do you want to start it off? Um, sure. Um, yes, I agree that the design approach that combines those elements, I think last time I was, I missed the last meeting, I was on vacation, but the meeting in 
July, we had talked about the drops and ripples being a little more whimsical, perhaps going with uh, um, the modern artistic approach. And then the River Oxbow was more, more classical, more like the Tide Arch. And I still have that reaction. But I think elements of both make make very good sense. And I'm not, I don't, I can't think of any other plaza elements to consider. I think the the voting choices on the um, the plantings being uh, the tree LA and then the formal plantings is consistent with the tide arch. It's much more classic, timeless um, is what the, the voting came out with. And that's what I think you're hearing from some of the commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Jasinski. Yeah, um, I agree that combining the uh, drops and ripples with the oxbow seems like the best course of action here. I just out of pure curiosity, I guess, what are we taking from each of those in combining them? And if they're if, if that might be too early in the design process, I'm not sure, but um, kind of basically what that would look like going forward. Yeah, I think we would be teasing out these elements that have been prioritized by the public starting there and looking at both of the design forms and the budget and really working back from there to see you know, what we can fit in the space realistically, um, given budget and <laughs> the, the size of the site and arrive at something that maybe has kind of the clean lines of the drops and ripples, but also some of these um, more environmental uh, kind of environmental elements of the stormwater planters and things that are in the river oxbow that people are also drawn to. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely uh, think that this would be a, having the drops and ripples would be a good way to kind of incorporate more of that nature and river design as if we're going to go with the tight arch as a, as the bridge main design as well. And I don't have any other elements to consider it at this time. Maybe once we get a little more further in the design process, I will. But. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mellon. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I guess you know, I, I like the idea of kind of using some of the elements of drops and ripples with the River Oxbow. Um, I was just kind of curious about, I, you know, the multiple smaller spaces and transitional spaces. I think back when we were, uh, the last time we met and talked about this, we talked about, you know, safe spaces too. And I think that's kind of what I'm seeing by the kind of the small spaces, tr tr transitional spaces being coming up second. You know, people want to feel safe when they're when they're sitting there. Uh, and I think that that's real important given that, you know, we've very, we, we envision this being used all times of the day and into the early, into the e evening. So having, um, you know, some, transitional spaces since this is going to connect that green chain I think that there's some real benefits to that so I'm kind of leaning towards the transitional spaces maybe a little bit more but um, certainly creating more of a kind of uh, a, 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 a sense of not this vast open space and I think that's why they wanted the smaller spaces um, other than that I, I think that you know you're picking up what people are interested in and um, you know, and, and again, tying the uh, the ripples and the uh, oxbow in with the um, with the bridge design, I think we we see that either any of those bridges could complement this. So um, I think, yeah, I think the public is is on the right track here. Good, Commissioner Greenfield. Uh, <clears throat> I find I think I may have the contrary view here. Uh, I find the drops and ripples and river oxbow concepts to be quite contrary to each other, uh, very different in concept and in feel. Um, I, I kind of wish that I had a way of uh, visualizing these better at ground level rather than a, from above. Um, <clears throat> but my sense of it is that the uh, overall the drops and ripples is a kind of sterile designy, uh, manufactured look that is not what Wilsonville's general sense of itself is about. Uh, it is somewhat like what we have in Memorial Park uh, in the, in the uh, 
the, the plaza in Memorial Park and, and also in Town Center Park, which are quite formal and, uh, and, and simple in design. Uh, but my sense of the River Oxbow is that it has more of a natural feel to it that I think uh, is more like those parts of or at least that part of uh, Memorial Park, and uh, and I think would be a nice uh, relief from the formalism of, of uh, Town Center Park, and and the formalism of uh, of, of much of uh, Villebois Park areas. Um, I don't know. I, I I I like the natural part of. of River Oxbow, and I don't, I don't see com what can be combined from River Oxbow really with Drops and Ripples in a natural way. Drops and Ripples has these formal areas that uh, are pretty much fixed and inflexible looking to me. Uh, the other thing is, I, I think as if I'm, if I'm trying to locate intimate spaces, it's easier in River Oxbow than it is in Drops and Ripples. And then if I may be allowed to argue against myself, I also want to raise the possibility that the, the, the consideration, again, without being able to visualize very clearly what it looks like at ground level, uh, that there is, is more privacy in River Oxbow than there is in Drops and Ripples. And for that reason, there may be, it may not be quite as safe, especially at night, as, as the more open area of, of Drops and Ripples is. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Heberlein? Yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Greenfield, I'm, I'm glad you went before me because you, I think you, you, uh, you summed up my, my feelings around drops and ripples in River Oxbow very well. Um, I'm very much of the same mind that, um, and, and I caveat this with, I'm an engineer by trade. So seeing and, and figuring out how to mash two things together is not necessarily my strong suit, but I struggle to see how you would take those two and put them together. Um, but I wouldn't be against seeing what that would look like to understand and be able to visualize it a little better. I'm not visualizing it right now. Doesn't mean that it can't be done. Um, in drops and ripples, I struggle to see how that one is designed as it's as I see it currently how that would do a good job at all of blocking sound from I five. Um, with at least the river oxbow you have what looks to be a grove of trees right near that um, that edge of, of the property closest to I five that would seem to be the most effective of those two options, so I think if if blocking sound from I five is a is a key priority, there needs to be some work there um, in either of those. Uh, I would expect that the gateway loop, if you were just looking at blocking sound from I-5 and trying to make a functional space for the rest of the plaza, would likely be a better option because of the, the larger mass that it has around the loop and, and that part of the design. Um, I'm not positive on that. That's just what my uh, initial impression was. Um, but I think overall, my preference would be towards River Oxbow um, and I don't know of any other elements that really need to be considered other than, I guess I'll go back to that. I think the other element that needs to be considered is how important sound uh, blocking and visual blocking is to the plaza. And if it is, then, then there's gonna need to be some work at Drops and Ripples was what was uh, chosen for uh, the final uh, version. Thank you. Um... As somebody who's worked on urban design uh, in all of these uh, conceptual designs, we put people, uh, we populate the design with people. And that doesn't sometimes happen. Uh, these become sterile spaces that nobody uses. Even though the, in the pictures, it looked like a lot of people used it. Uh, to me, uh, the the issue that I had in deciding between drops and ripples and river oxbow had to do with the size of that area. To me, if you're going with a natural meandering path, open kind of a park, natural park uh, design, which river oxbow kind of is, 
it needs to be large. Uh, otherwise, it will look uh, uh, like one of these uh, playground uh, uh, labyrinth areas where, where kids are supposed to follow the path and see if they can uh, find uh, the end from the start. Uh, the drops and ripples creates smaller intimate spaces for people to sit and, and not be in a large crowd in a no man's land kind of a, 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 an area. So to me, mixing these two is really mixing the elements of a natural landscape, which is not very large because the, the area of this uh, uh, plaza is not that large with small areas where you can sit and have a more intimate space or define a more intimate space. Uh, so that if there's a lot of people there, you can still have a level of privacy and you don't feel like you're um, in a large crowd that's sitting on the lawn waiting for a concert uh, at, without any privacy or without any separation. On the one hand, on the other hand, you're adding natural areas and uh, uh, planting so that it doesn't become fake kind of uh, Disneyland kind of a, a, a design, which drops and ripples has the potential of becoming. So to me, the mixing that is being talked about is creating a space that allows for that uh, open, uh, and natural kind of environment, but also allows for spaces to be claimed by smaller groups. Uh, and as a result is functional for both large groups and small groups, and doesn't look like it's a desolate area that nobody is using uh, if it's just a large um, natural area uh, or, or a lawn kind of looking thing. The issue of noise abatement to me um, I think is a lost cause hmm. because the side of the plaza that's adjacent to the highway is very small. It's, it, this is a long plaza. And even if you had a wall on that uh, adjacent uh, uh, to the highway, uh, to the left and to the right is gonna be open and noise is coming in up and down the highway. So I think um, you just are going to have to have softer uh, plantings and softer surfaces that perhaps buffers a little bit of the sound uh, and maybe buffers some of the fumes. But I think we are stuck with the uh, reality that this is a plaza adjacent to a bridge over a, an interstate. Chair Mesba, I given that that feedback, I guess I would I would pose the the general question of of how active of a space is this really going to be given its proximity to the freeway? Are there other examples where we have in, in other cities where there is a space this close to the freeway that is active? Well, the question will be active for what? You're not going to have a Shakespeare play here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, is it a place that you would spend any significant time having a conversation? Probably uh, not. Uh, especially not close to the highway, I wouldn't think. Although in some of the uh, drops and ripples uh, uh, designs of, of the kind of uh, these pockets, it is possible to have uh, sound editing kinds of uh, materials that allows you to sit in a kind of a cubby and not be uh, as um, uh, as subject to the noise of the high, depending on orientation and all that. So I can see design elements that will help that. Uh, and you can have a conversation, uh, but I don't think you're going to have a... a, a a, an artistic kind of presentation that requires being able to hear every uh, nuance. A rock concert, perhaps, but not a Shakespeare play. <laughs>
I think those are those are really helpful comments. I think you know, partly to get at Commissioner Greenfield's question too is you know how do these elements come together? Um, I think we've gotten pretty good direction from Planning Commission on you know that some combination of drops and ripples. Um, one, we need to be able to start to think about that and how that how that comes together and what are the specific elements that work well um, together, but also to um, you identify Commissioner Mesbaugh, as you, as you stated, you know, what type of gathering places are these? Um, you know, it's it's even through the town center plan, this was never envisioned to be a place where it's going to be a ballpark and you know everybody's hanging out. It is a key space for gathering, but it is also that transitional <laughs> space entered into the Emerald Emerald Chain um, as a part of of the larger town center plan. So I think that's going to be something that the design team can start to think about as, as more of a refined plaza alternative and what those key kind of intimate versus larger spaces um, include. So uh, given that comment, uh, Alex, the worst thing that can happen here is if this becomes a pass-through element that nobody wants to spend time at. And here we are spending all this kind of time trying to design it. So that people will rest and you know have have an intimate seat seating and all that. Uh, if it's just a pass through area, River Oxbow would be probably the best design because it's low maintenance. It will look okay and good because it's very kind of natural, and it doesn't have any area that you would sit. It's designed to just pass through. I think it, I think it's a balance if we look at you know, the future area, you know, for adjacent redevelopment potential and others, you know, we do want this, this is, you know, the first step in town center in terms of redevelopment. So, you know, the ultimate form of this should support adjacent redevelopment as it occurs over time. And so I think there is, you know, it does serve a variety of uses. One is pass through, people are going to go up and down the bridge, you know, it's the point that you hit ground in town center. But I think it is important to consider that these there are spaces here where people will want to gather, you know, as a for a concert, probably not, but as a place to, you know, sit in the afternoon and enjoy the sun. That's certainly um, something that we've heard is important for people um, to be able to provide as well. So I think it, it is that balance of, yeah, we're next to a freeway, but we also want these kind of key spaces that are integrated with other components of town center. So that's a good reminder because one of the things we were talking about at the town center design when we were going through that is that the first floors of these uh, redeveloped areas are going to have uh, the possibility of restaurants or, or coffee shops with outside seating. This would be a great place for it. Definitely. Again, if I'm sitting with my earbuds in and a cup of cappuccino reading my paper, I don't have any problem with the noise because I have the, you know, I've taken <laughs> care of that. But uh, it is not going to be an area where you're going to have congregations enjoying the outdoors. Is I guess what we were, we were talking about. So, but it's a good point that this is potentially going to have uh, uses by adjacent uh, redevelopments uh, that would make it amenable to to outdoor seating and those kinds of things. So did you get all of the uh, comments you wanted, uh, Alex, or should we, should we throw it out for a final uh, go around? I think, I think everybody was pretty clear. Casey, um, are you comfortable with kind of direction moving forward? And Bob and Zach, you as well? Yes, I think this is very valuable. Um, yeah, I'm good. I appreciate it. With that, Commissioner Mesa, yeah, this has been this has been a, a very helpful conversation. And what we'll do in terms of next steps moving forward is we are meeting with City Council um, on Monday, and so you know this this direction will help us um, have that conversation with them as well about how to how to move forward with these specific elements. So thank you for the time, everybody. Thank you for your work. Hopefully, we were helpful. Yeah, always. Uh, I'll I'll ask you after you meet with the council. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, very well. Uh, we have uh, informational uh, elements. The city council 
action minutes were included in your packet. There is no staff presentation. Any of the commissioners uh, have any comments about that? No. And the 2020 PC work program was also included. Um, Mr. Pauly, uh, are we on schedule uh, for the rest of the year or are things going to be flexible and change? Things are, it's 2020, so it's always flexible, right? So, uh, <laughs> but uh, I would call attention that uh, there are a couple of things started stacking up where it really made sense to have a November meeting. So previously that was because of Veterans Day, we were not going to hold that meeting, but Tammy, I know, reached out and confirmed uh, availability and that we appreciate the flexibility uh, of the commission of being flexible to have the November meeting on alternative on an alternative date. So uh, that's a change since last month. Um, and speaking of flexibility with schedule, also just want to add a very grateful uh, to the commissioners and all the parties involved to being flexible with the change from last week to this week and and having it completely virtual and it's good to see that it worked out and we were able to get this business and have a good conversation tonight. And so again, thank you for your flexibility and willingness to work with us during this interesting time. Thank you very much. Uh, any last minute things, comments? Otherwise we are ready for motion to adjourn. Uh, I'll make the motion that we adjourn. Thank you. I'll second the motion. Thank you. That was Commissioner Millen seconding and Commissioner Willard making the motion for uh, Ms. Pinyard. And so the uh, uh, Planning Commission meeting is adjourned at 724, I have. All Thank right. you. Hey, everyone. Take stay care, safe. Everyone. Stay, stay safe. <laughs>